Hello everybody and thanks for joining us today for this webinar on decision making for adults lacking capacity. Firstly, apologies to those who attended last week. We had some technical difficulties which meant that the webinar did have to get arranged to um, today instead, uh, but we're all working fine today. So just a few housekeeping points to start with. Um, if there is a technical hitch, please do bear with us. Um, for those of you joining by PC, laptop, tablet or smartphone, you should now be able to see this introduction slide. So questions can be submitted throughout the webinar as directed on the screen now, and I will answer as many as possible at the end of the session. If we do run out of time for any questions, there will be some written answers posted online alongside the webinar, which hopefully will assist if we don't get around to answer all, answering all of them. So to get started then, the Mental Capacity Act, why do we need it? So for people who lack capacity, the relevant statutory framework can be found within the Mental Capacity Act. Now, there are lots of people in the UK who lack capacity to make decisions, and that's for a variety of reasons, such as, as it says on slide, dementia, learning disabilities, mental health problems, stroke, brain injury. Um, and there are lots of decisions which are being made on behalf of those people every single day. So there was a need for a comprehensive and workable legal framework to be put in place to ensure that those decisions were being made in the right way. So the Mental Capacity Act 2005 came into effect in 2007 and the MCA essentially establishes a legal framework for decision making for people over 16 years of age who lack capacity. Now the Act is really wide ranging, it covers health and welfare decisions such as a person's care arrangements, their residence where they should live, the contact that they have with other people, their capacity to enter into marriage and have sexual relations with other people. And it also includes their property and affairs as well, decisions regarding property and affairs. Uh, since 2007, the Act has since been amended so that it also includes provisions relating to deprivation of liberty. And we're gonna come, come on to those later on in this webinar. So the general principles which underpin the Mental Capacity Act are set out on the screen there and I'll rattle through these um, relatively quickly. So the first is that a person must be assumed to have capacity unless it's established that he lacks capacity. And I think that's a really important starting point that decisions shouldn't just be made on behalf of somebody simply because somebody thinks they might lack capacity. It really should be established formally that the person does lack capacity in relation to the decision being made. In terms of establishing that somebody lacks capacity, it's important that a person is given all of the practical support possible to help make, them, make the decision themselves before a decision is made on their behalf. The third principle is that everybody is entitled to make an unwise decision. And simply because a person chooses to make an unwise decision does not mean that they should be treated as lacking capacity. For anybody who does lack capacity, then decisions made and acts done must be done in their best interests. And we'll come on to what that means later on in the webinar. Decisions and acts should also be what's known as the least restrictive option. And that essentially means that what is being done needs to be done in a way which is less restrictive of the person's rights and freedom of action as possible. Now, I'll just pause there for a second and say that quite often through this webinar, I'll be referring to the person who lacks capacity as the, as the patient or as P. And that's just generally how people who lack capacity are known in this kind of framework. So when I refer to P, I'm talking about the person who has been assessed as lacking capacity. So does a person lack mental capacity? Well, as I've said, there should be a presumption that a person has capacity unless established otherwise. And it can be established otherwise by way of a formal assessment. And that's usually done by a psychiatrist, a social worker, a best interests assessor, or another suitably qualified professional. Now, the legal test for whether somebody lacks capacity is set out there in section two of the Mental Capacity Act. 
And essentially, a person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time, he is unable to make a decision for himself in relation to the matter because of an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain. Now, there's some guidance there on the screen as well. Um, in particular, it doesn't matter if the impairment is permanent or temporary because it's the material time that a decision is being made which is relevant for the purpose of the act. So the measure of mental capacity is what we call decision specific. Now that means that there are different legal tests which are applied for each decision which is being made. So there are different tests for a person's capacity to make decisions about their care compared to where they should live, compared to whether they have capacity to enter into marriage. So if you hear the term P lacks capacity, then you should all, always be thinking about in which domain does P lack capacity? Because there is a very structured test within the Act which sets out when P will be unable to make a decision for himself. And the four stage test is there on the screen. And so the test is whether P is able to understand information relevant to the decision, retain that information, use or weigh up that information as part of making the decision and communicate their decision. And it's important that communication can be verbally, using sign language or any other means that P feels able to use by way of communication. And so you can hopefully see by looking at that test and the fact that there are different tests depending on which decision is being made, that it's perfectly possible for a person to have capacity in one context, but not in another. So for example, as it says on the slide there, a person might be able to decide where they want to live more generally, but may not have capacity to decide whether to buy or sell property, which is more um, of a complex decision. If there's a dispute over capacity, so if the local authority and, for example, the parents of P can't agree that P lacks capacity, or if different professionals have different views on whether P lacks capacity, then an application can be made to the Court of Protection um, and the Court of Protection can make a declaration on the issue of capacity. And we're going to come on to the role of the Court of Protection later on during this webinar. So assuming that a person lacks capacity, then decisions need to be made in their best interests. Now, strangely, best interests is not actually defined within the Mental Capacity Act, but there is um, a great deal of guidance available within the Act itself. And some of that guidance is on, this, on the slide there. So the person making the decision should take into account all of the circumstances, including whether the person is likely to regain capacity in the future because it stands to reason that if P stands to regain capacity in the future, then the decision should be delayed until such time that P can make the decision for themselves. It's also really important that P is as involved in the decision-making process as possible. So when making the decision, things to be taken into account firstly are P's wishes and feelings and relevant weight will be attached to those wishes and feelings and it's extremely important that the decision maker takes the time to speak to P or otherwise to find out about P's past and present wishes and feelings. Now as you can see on the slide there I've also said that other people should be consulted and working within this area of law um, a significant issue which we come up against time and time again is where a decision has been made in P's best interests but where family members just simply have not been consulted at all. Now the Act makes clear that that should not happen so family members and anybody involved in the caring of P should be consulted when a decision is being made and we get lots of inquiries from family members who say they haven't been consulted before a decision is being made. And arguably, because those decisions haven't been made in accordance with the Act, those decisions can be challenged. So moving on to who can make the decision. Well, day to day, there will be many issues that crop up where a decision needs to be made, such as what, what is P going to wear today? Now, for those low level decisions, 
those supporting piece, such as carers, support workers, PAs can help make those decisions. If there are bigger decisions to be made, such as what care package does P require, what support does P require in the community, then those decisions really should be made at a higher level, usually by the social worker or the organisation funding the care package. If there's a really significant decision which is going to be made, which is going to have quite an impact on P's life, then it may be appropriate for a best interest meeting to be convened. And this is really an opportunity to get everybody who's relevant to the decision making around a table to discuss the decision being made and to hopefully come up with an agreed decision in P's best interests. Equally, if there is a lasting power of attorney or deputyship in place, then the person appointed under such an LPA or deputyship can make the final decision. I should add there that even though there might be a power of attorney or a deputyship, that person making the decision must still adhere to the principles of the MCA. So the decision and the, the decision being made must still be made in P's best interests. Moving on to power of attorney, um, a power of attorney can only be made by somebody who's over 18 years old and they need to have capacity at the time to make an LPA. So the attorney makes decisions in the best interests of P. So there's no carte blanche there, they still have to follow the MCA principles. Alternatively, if a person over 18 already lacks capacity, then LPA won't be appropriate and instead you'd be looking at appointment of a deputy. Now there are two types of deputy, property and affairs, which is fairly common, where a person will have a deputy who manages their finances day to day. Less common is health and welfare deputyship, although these are becoming more regular recently, um, although still not as common as property and affairs. So who can be a deputy? Well, anybody over the age of 18. Um, in terms of what the powers of a deputy are, well, for property and affairs, the court will make an order which sets out what the deputy's powers are. So the, the powers of the deputy for property and affairs will be limited by court order. And the deputy will need to follow the principles of the MCA and act in the person's best interests. As I said before, welfare de deputies historically have been fairly rare because the court of protection has always preferred one-off applications to be made to the court in the event of a dispute. Um, these are now increasing and it's likely that a health and welfare deputy will be appointed on application if it looks as though a series of decisions is going to be made about P. So if there are likely to be frequent disagreements or frequent big decisions which need to be put before the court, then in those circumstances, the court may consider that it's more appropriate for a welfare deputy to be appointed from the outset to avoid the need for the parties to come to court each time the decision is made. And finally, an extra safeguard for P is the development of IMPCAs, independent mental capacity advocates. Now, an IMCA is essentially a person who is independently appointed to act on P's behalf and their role is to articulate P's wishes and feelings and the aim is to keep P at the centre of the decision which is being made. An IMCA should be appointed where there's a significant decision being made um, about P to ensure that P is put at the heart of the process um, and that their wishes and feelings aren't lost through the decision making process. There are a couple of other sections within the MCA just to be aware of. I'll just briefly touch on these. Um, section five, firstly, provides a defence to liability for actions done on behalf of people who lack capacity, where there's a reasonable belief that the person lacks capacity and reasonable belief that the action you've taken is in that person's best interests. Now, that section does not extend to the use of restraint for P. So the use of restraint will only be defended if there is a reasonable belief that restraint was necessary to prevent harm to P and that it was a proportionate response to that risk and likely nature of harm. So in summary then, decisions made for people who lack capacity need to be made in their best interests. Before decisions should be made, 
There should be consultation with P and P's family and those involved in P's care. Um, so now we're going to look at what if there is a dispute or a disagreement as to what is in P's best interests. And that's where the Court of Protection comes in. So the Court of Protection was established by the Mental Capacity Act and its jurisdiction is limited to where P lacks capacity. So the Court of Protection can make one-off decisions, it can appoint deputies, it can make declarations as to P's capacity and best interests where this is disputed. So if a decision has been made about P and there is disagreement, what should you do? Well, the first thing is really to try and resolve it on the ground. And quite often what will happen is there will be just a lack of communication between the parties involved and it will feel that a decision has been made wrongly or incorrectly or against what is in P's best interests simply because there isn't enough information sharing. And in those circumstances, it's always advisable to try and sit down and have a formal best interest meeting so that everybody's views and concerns can be aired and hopefully the disagreement will be resolved. If that's not possible, then an application should be made to the Court of Protection. Now, usually it's the local authority or the NHS Trust who should make the application. However, sometimes the local authority or the trust will decline to do that and the family members will still want the issue to be brought before the Court of Protection. Now, in those circumstances, it is possible for P to initiate the proceedings with the assistance of a litigation friend. It's also possible for a family member to make the application in their own name. And it's also possible for a deputy or an IMCA to make the application on P's behalf as well. So the Court of Protection's remit then is to decide what is in P's best interests and they will decide that having reviewed all of the relevant evidence and weighed up the various concerns of everybody involved. The Court can also terminate an LPA or deputy ship if it seems appropriate and the Court can act urgently or out of hours if required. So how do we make sure that P is at the centre of the dispute? Well, P should really be involved in the proceedings if possible, but if P lacks capacity to conduct the proceedings, then P will need a litigation friend. Now, the litigation friend can be a family member, although sometimes that's not appropriate because of the nature of the dispute which has arisen. And so in those circumstances, it might be more appropriate for an IMCA to act as P's litigation friend or for the official solicitor to act as a last resort. Now, court proceedings carry with it a stigma that it will be expensive and court protection proceedings are unfortunately no different. Um, the slight saving grace is that legal aid is still available for health and welfare applications to the court of protection. Legal aid in such matters is means assessed on both income and capital. At the moment, there's no proposal to change that. But as with any eligibility for legal aid, the goalposts are constantly changing. Now for deprivation of liberty cases, which I'm going to come on to later on, there is non-means tested legal aid available. Now there's an obvious crossover between safeguarding and the Court of Protection. And I've just set out a few slides here to basically set out the main provisions and legal framework to bear in mind within this area. So the Care Act and the Mental Capacity Act form the basis of the legal framework and the main provisions are set out there on the slides. And you'll note the duty to promote well-being underpins everything within the Care Act and safeguarding is contained within Section 42. So safeguarding itself is, is a huge topic and one which probably needs to be addressed in its own webinar. But essentially, the Care Act has imposed a number of duties on local authorities and I've set those out there on the slide so that you've got them as a point of reference. So if there are safeguarding concerns, then these really should be raised individually with the safeguarding team for the relevant local authority. If there seem to be a pattern of concerns within a local authority, then it is possible to raise those concerns collectively with the Director of Social Services. Um, and for further guidance about safeguarding, because as I say, it's a very large topic, I've just put some links on to the Care and Support Statutory Guidance and the Social Care Institute for Excellence, which has some really good resources for anybody who needs them. <laughs> 
OK, so moving on to the second part of the webinar, which is surrounding deprivation of liberty. So the basis of deprivation of liberty and where it comes from can be traced back to the European Convention on Human Rights. So Article 5 of the Convention guarantees everybody a right to liberty. And this is a real fundamental right which can't be deprived or interfered with unless that deprivation or interference is in accordance with the law. So there are a number of statutory provisions which form the law relevant to deprivation of liberty and I've just put the main ones there on the slide for reference. So linking deprivation of liberty back to the principles of the Mental Capacity Act, it's quite clear that they are extremely relevant. So deprivation of liberty must be in a person's best interests and it must be the least restrictive option. And that is quite often where disputes will arise. As to why deprivation of liberty is important, well, there are a great deal of people who lack capacity, but who don't fall within the definition or the protection of the Mental Health Act. And for that reason, there needed to be a separate system which provided protection and safeguards for vulnerable adults who don't fall within the Mental Health Act. So the current system derives back to a case called Bournewood, which was back in 2004. And the Bournewood case involved an autistic man who was living in the community. He was readmitted to Bournewood Hospital, but he was not sectioned under the Mental Health Act. And therefore, he did not have available to him the protections provided under the Mental Health Act, such as the right to review his detention. So a dispute arose about his care and treatment. And the court essentially said that the deprivation of his liberty was not in accordance with the law. And the reason for that was because there was no opportunity for him to review the conditions of his detention and therefore there was no compliance with Article 5 of the Convention on Human Rights because Article 5 puts a positive obligation on the state to protect individuals Article 5 right to liberty. So in summary then, at that time in the UK there were no formal procedures for who could authorise detention there was no procedure for the reasons for admission or the need for continuing clinical assessment and review. And there was no framework by which there was somebody appointed to represent P and to seek a review of the lawfulness of his detention. And this colloquially became known as the Bournewood Gap, a gap within the law and legal provision. So as a result of the Bournewood Gap, there was introduced the deprivation of liberty safeguards and the safeguards were inserted directly into the Mental Capacity Act. And so they now form part of the Mental Capacity Act. And the deprivation of liberty safeguards is essentially a scheme to authorise and provide protection for people who are deprived of their liberty, but who don't fall within the Mental Health Act. And you can see there that the deprivation of liberty safeguards have also been incorporated into the MCA code of practice and it's quite clear that deprivation of a person's liberty is a very serious matter. It shouldn't happen unless absolutely necessary and in the best interests of the person involved and that really underpins the whole purpose of the safeguards. So when do the deprivation of liberty safeguards apply? For ease, I'm going to refer to the deprivation of liberty safeguards as dolls. Now, dolls is essentially an on paper method of authorising a deprivation of liberty. It's done by the local authority in order to authorise a person being deprived of their liberty in a hospital or a care home which is CQC registered. So in those circumstances, if somebody is in a care home deprived of their liberty, the local authority will on paper authorise that deprivation of liberty so long as a number of criteria are met and we'll come on to what those criteria are in a second. But there's no reason or no need at that point for the authorisation of the deprivation of liberty to be referred to the Court of Protection. The authorisation itself can be done on the papers by the local authority. In contrast, if P lives in a community setting, such as an independent supported living placement, which is not registered with CQC, then 
their deprivation of liberty cannot be authorised using the dolls system. It can't be done on paper. In those circumstances, that person's deprivation of liberty in independent support of living or wherever it is would need to be authorised by an order from the Court of Protection. So the next few slides that I'm going to go on to are the deprivation of liberty safeguards, the dolls, and they apply to people in care homes registered with CQC or in hospital. So as I said, there are various criteria for dolls to apply, and that includes an age requirement, a mental capacity requirement, a mental health requirement, and an eligibility requirement. Now, the most important thing to note on this slide, I think, is the age requirement, because the Mental Capacity Act applies to anybody who's 16 or over. However, the deprivation of liberty safeguards only apply to those 18 or over. So if there is a person who is 16 or 17 year old and they are in a CQC registered placement, their deprivation of liberty cannot be authorised using this safeguards procedure their deprivation of liberty must be authorised by the court. So the further criteria is that the, the proposed deprivation is in the person's best interests and it also should be noted that there should be no less restrictive means of meeting their best interests and there should also be no valid advance decisions so the person should not have already refused the treatment by way of a living will for example. So the application of the rules then, what happens? Well, P will be admitted to a care home or a hospital and the care home will request from the local authority a standard authorisation. Now, a standard authorisation is a document which authorises the deprivation of liberty. Following that request, the local authority will initiate various assessments to make sure that all of the criteria we've just been through are met. Now, during the process, there's a duty to consult with the family about the dolls. So the family should be asked, do you think that these arrangements are in P's best interests? Do you think that, the, that P could be cared for in a less restrictive environment? During the process, P should also be appointed what's called a relevant person's representative or RPR. This is essentially an, a type of advocate as per an IMCA who will be appointed independently to speak for P and to articulate P's wishes and feelings. Now, in some cases, a family member will be willing to take on the role of RPR. Equally, in some cases, that won't be appropriate. And the reason for that is that in some, some cases, P will be naturally objecting to any proposed placement, even though it might be in his best interests. If that is the case and P is continually objecting, then the RPR is under a duty to refer the matter to court. And quite often family members will not feel comfortable with referring the matter to court because they might see the bigger picture that actually they think it is in P's best interests to be there. And therefore there would be a slight conflict of interest arising there. And to make sure that P's rights and wishes are respected, an independent relevant persons representative will be appointed instead. Now, if all of the criteria are met, then a standard authorisation will be granted. The maximum period it can be granted for is 12 months. And after 12 months elapse, then there will be further assessments to make sure that the criteria are still met. So if, for example, P progressed and P's needs decreased and they could be met in a less restrictive setting, then that should be picked up on review and P would subsequently be moved to a less restrictive placement. Equally, the standard authorisation doesn't have to be set for 12 months. It can be set for a shorter time if, for example, it's envisaged that there will be a change in P circumstances in three to six months. It might be better to have a shorter standard authorisation so that at the relevant time, review can take place and we can reassess whether it's still the right place for P to be living. So you can attach conditions to the standard authorisation and quite often we see conditions re regarding the amount of access that P is to have to the community to ensure that P remains engaged in the community and doesn't become socially isolated. Um, and essentially it's the managing authority who has to control the conditions and make sure that they're complied with. 
Now, the managing authority is the placement itself. It's not the local authority, it's the actual placement. So if the criteria are met, the standard authorization is granted. This, the effect of the standard authorization is to authorize the deprivation of liberty. And that means that P's Article 5 right has not been interfered with unlawfully because it has been done in accordance with a legal lawful procedure. So the overview there is um, identification of the need for authorization. The application will be made for an authorization. The local authority will give consideration to that application, carry out the relevant assessments, appoint an RPR on P's behalf, grant the authorization, and then in due course, the standard authorization will be reviewed on its expiry and it will be decided whether to grant a further standard authorization or whether that's no longer appropriate. So a summary of checks and balances then, the supervisory body, and that's the local authority, can review the standard authorisation and they should do that if they think that one or more criteria are no longer met. So if they don't think that it's in P's best interests to be in that placement anymore, then they should review the standard authorisation and they should review all the criteria which go along with it to see whether P should be moved somewhere else. Equally, if P's loss of capacity has been temporary, the local authority might want to review the standard authorization if they think P might have regained capacity because then P wouldn't meet the mental capacity requirement for a dolls. The RPR can re request a review at any time. Now that can be done in writing to the local authority and that's something which probably isn't done enough, um, but certainly if there are concerns about the restrictiveness of the placement on P, whether P is having enough community access, then that really is the first step to request a review to see where everybody stands and to see whether those issues and concerns can be resolved on the ground. If that's not possible, then the next step would be to refer to the court protection and that would be on the basis that, that there is a dispute over what is in P's best interests. The other reason why the case might be referred to the Court of Protection is that P might be objecting to his placement. So P might be saying things like, I don't want to live here, I want to move home, or P might be saying, I'd rather live at home. I don't mind living here, but I'd rather live at home. In those circumstances, the RPR is under a legal duty to refer the case to the Court of Protection so that the court can review the deprivation of liberty in view of P's objections, and that really is an added safeguard to make sure that P's voice is heard at court. For those cases, non-means-tested legal aid is available, which means that P will automatically be eligible. There will be no financial assessment for those types of cases. So as I said a few slides ago, the DOLS paper process only applies when somebody is in a hospital or is in a CQC registered care home. If P is living in a supported community placement, such as independent supported living, then that paper process just is not available. And to authorise a deprivation of liberty in those circumstances, an application must be made to the court and the court will make an order which, if in best interests, will authorise P's deprivation of liberty. Now, importantly, the case of SRK, which is referred to on your slide there from 2016, is extremely important. Um, the SRK case addressed the situation where P lives in a fully private setting where the local authority has no input whatsoever. And essentially what the local authority have said, what the court has said, sorry, is that in those circumstances, there is still a deprivation of liberty. And we do need to look at whether that, whether that deprivation can be authorized via the court of protection. So we've talked about the process, how to authorize a deprivation of liberty, but Let's consider now, what is the test for deprivation of liberty? What constitutes a deprivation of liberty? And the, lead case in, the leading case in this area is the case of Cheshire West. Now, essentially there are three limbs to whether P is deprived of his or her liberty. 
The first is that P is objectively deprived of his or her liberty. The second is that P has not consented to the deprivation of liberty. And the third limb is that the deprivation of liberty is imputable to the state. And the imputable to the state part is important because that's what links the person's Article 5 right to the need for the authorisation to be put in place. So we're going to focus on the first limb of the test in this webinar. Um, so assuming that P lacks capacity to consent to his care and residence arrangements and assuming that the local authority involved because they will have carried out care and support assessment and there will be an element of social services involvement within the person's care package. So we're going to assume that limbs two and three are satisfied and we're going to focus on is P objectively deprived of his or her liberty. So in the Cheshire West case, P was an adult with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome and he required 24 hour care to meet his personal needs. He was placed in local authority community placement, which was a bungalow which he shared with two residents. And the question of whether those arrangements, so the 24 seven care package, whether those arrangements constituted a deprivation of his liberty went all the way to the Supreme Court. So the local authority in Cheshire West said, no, that's not a deprivation of liberty. It can't be. And P, represented by the official solicitor and P's family said, no, this is a deprivation of P's liberty. The judge decided that the acid test for whether somebody is deprived of their liberty is whether, firstly, they are under continuous supervision and control. And secondly, they are not free to leave. So when we're talking about is somebody under continuous supervision and control, are they free to leave? We're really thinking about the intensity of the care package that they have. So how often is P observed, monitored, checked on? Even if P has some time alone, if there is somebody within the same residence as him who would be checking on him and would be on hand to provide any help should he need it then that would still amount to continuous supervision and control if we're thinking about whether p is free to leave this also encompasses the situation whereby p might leave but has agreed to come back at a certain point and it's really looking at if p didn't return to the home when expected what steps would be taken if the steps that would be taken are that steps would be taken to find P and to return P or that the police might be called to try and return P to the house, then in those circumstances, even though he might have a few hours in the community where he is on his own, those steps that would be taken if he didn't return to the home mean that he is not essentially free to leave. Also important to consider here is the use of technology. And as, as things progress, this will become more and more important to think about. But P might not well have somebody physically there with him. However, there might be door sensors, there might be sensor mats, there might be alarms, all of which would alert a care agency or a carer that P was up and about and about to leave the property. In those circumstances, those measures such as door sensors and alarms and sensor mats would amount to continuous supervision and control. So not relevant to the acid test is the person's compliance or lack of objection. So P might be perfectly happy with the placement and the care arrangements. They might get along really well with the care team. Everything might be going great. That doesn't matter. It's an objective test. The relative normality of the placement it might be a really lovely placement. It might really feel like home for P. Again, it's an objective test. So the normality of the placement is irrelevant. And the third one, I think, is, is really important. And the reason behind or the purpose behind a particular placement is irrelevant. And the quote that's put there was actually taken from Cheshire West. Um, and it was Baroness Hale who said a gilded cage is still a cage. So the fact that there are good intentions behind a care package and that the care package has been set up to keep P safe, to make sure that P doesn't become socially isolated, to make sure that P is having all the opportunities that you would want P to have, is irrelevant because the test is objective. Do the arrangements meet the ACID test objectively? If so, P is deprived of his or her liberty.
And I think the difficulty that family members often come across here is to try is is the, the temptation to make negative connotations of the word deprived because in, in normal parlance, deprived means somebody has been deprived of something negatively. Um, and in this scenario, nobody would be saying, you know, the, the fact that somebody has um, a brilliant care package, which is set up with quite high intensity to make sure that P is engaged in all aspects and has a really full life. You wouldn't necessarily describe that as a deprivation, but in these circumstances, deprivation of liberty is an objective test. It sounds bad for P, but try not to have those negative connotations attached to it. It simply reflects the arrangements on the ground that meet the acid test. And just as important is to err on the side of caution. And again, Baroness Hale within the Cheshire West judgment said, because we are dealing with extremely vulnerable people, we need to err on the side of caution when deciding what constitutes deprivation of liberty. So the implications of Cheshire West were huge. Um, the acid test from Cheshire West expanded the application of deprivation of liberty so wide. Um, all of a sudden, everybody who was in a CQC registered care home or who had an intense care package, lots of people with learning disability, with cerebral palsy, with brain injury, with stroke, all of those people all of a sudden became encompassed by the Cheshire West definition. Now, the purpose of deprivation of liberty is to protect P, to make sure that P has independent reviews of his deprivation of liberty and has the ability to challenge the placement. And that really is the one thing to take from this webinar. It's there to protect P. It's to make sure that the measures that are in place are in P's best interests. Now, in quite a lot of cases, there will be supportive, loving friends and family around P who are making sure that those arrangements are in P's best interests. And it might be that those cases never get to the court of protection because everything is set up for P, it's in his best interest and everything's going fine. Equally, however, there will be cases where that's not the case. And Cheshire West deprivation of liberty in this area of law generally provides protection for those scenarios so that P has an avenue, a route to challenge the deprivation of liberty in case it's not in his best interests. I've just put a few slides in here of the recent case of Ferreira. Now, this is a recent case which has caused some controversy within this area of law because, as it says on the slide there, um, it involved a 45 year old woman with Down syndrome and learning disabilities who died in intensive care. And the family asked the coroner to treat her death, treat her as, as being de deprived of her liberty at the time of her death and thus to call a jury. Now, the coroner decided to do so, to decline to do so. And the question from this case really was, was P in intensive care deprived of her liberty? Now, given what we've just said about a gilded cage is still a cage, the purpose behind a deprivation of liberty is irrelevant. It's about the objective test. You might think that you'd know what the court was going to say in this case. However, the Court of Appeal held that a, a deprivation of liberty which results from P being in intensive care, receiving life sustaining treatment is not a deprivation of liberty. And I'll just take a minute there to let you all read the slide, um, which is currently on the screen. So the Court of Appeals decision was based on the fact that the lack of P's freedom and ability to leave was because of his or her illness and condition and not because of any action taken by the state. Now, you can see that this judgment has been potentially made from a practical public interest perspective, um, but you can also hopefully see that it's not really consistent with the principles within Cheshire West. So we've reached the end of the webinar, but I think we have had some questions through. So I'm just going to take a minute or two to have a read through the questions and then I'll pop back online to answer those for you. Okay, so the first question that we've had is in relation to a young person with severe LD and whether if that person has been deemed to have capacity to refuse to go to school or college, 
can they be deemed to have capacity to do that? Even if by doing so they are restricting and they're restricting their opportunities to extend education. Well, essentially the starting point there is just because somebody has severe LD, there is obviously a presumption that they have capacity to make that decision themselves. Um, the first step, if there are concerns about their capacity to make that decision, is to have a formal capacity assessment completed, perhaps by a social worker or if there is a psychologist or alternative professional involved. So pending a formal assessment being completed, um, that would be the first step really. Once the assessment's been completed, if the person is assessed as having capacity to refuse to attend school, then the law unfortunately states that that is that person's right. Um, and this is a situation where somebody maybe has been perceived to make an unwise decision, as is their right as a person with capacity to do so. If the person is assessed as lacking capacity, then a decision can be made in their best interests. But I think the real things to consider there are practically how will how will that change things because for something to be in a person's best interest you do need to weigh up if you're considering saying it's in a person's best interest to go to school what kind of support what kind of steps are going to be needed to get the person to school and balancing those against the reasons why the person doesn't want to go to school in the first place um, and i think if the person doesn't have capacity then really thinking about that person's well-being and whether it is appropriate to say it's in their best interests to attend school. But like I say, first step, capacity assessment. Does the person have capacity to make that decision? If so, then frustratingly, um, they can make that unwise decision not to attend school, I'm afraid. The second question that we've had come in um, is in relation to appointeeship versus deputyship. And the question has come from Rob, so thank you for your question. Um, just as an outline for the other attendees, I'm just going to quickly rattle through the difference between appointeeship and deputyship and then give some general guidance around which might be more appropriate in your case, Rob. Um, appointeeship, essentially, it's appointing somebody to manage benefits and managing a small amount or a limited amount of savings. So that arrangement is going to be appropriate where somebody has a low level of assets whether when they're in receipt of benefits and they don't really have any other income as well and applications for appointeeship are made via the dwp and there's quite a lot of guidance online about how to do that on the gov.uk website as well conversely deputyship um a deputy for property and affairs is appointed by the court of protection and that's following a formal application being made to the court now deputyship will be more appropriate if the affairs are more complex so if the person has a higher level of savings, if they have assets, valuables, um, and an application can be made either with or without legal advice, and it will be granted where it's perceived that there will be frequent best interest decisions that need to be made in that regard, because if there are likely to be those types of decisions which will need to be referred to the court, then ordinarily the court will save for property and affairs you know, on a practical level, it's much more appropriate to have somebody who can just do those applications on the ground without the need to have to come to court every time. Property and affairs deputyship, as I said during the webinar, they're quite common, um, but it's important to note that they do come with a lot of responsibility, and that includes accounting to the Office of Public Guardian each year for all of the spending which has been done on P's behalf, and it also includes doing things like tax returns. So before you think about making an application for deputyship, it's certainly worth considering what would be involved because it is quite labour intensive and there is quite a lot of admin to do as well so it depends how comfortable you feel doing those kinds of tasks. Now Rob in your email you've referred to um, whether being a deputy would help to secure a particular type of accommodation. Generally court of protection deputyship for property and affairs is unlikely to put you in a better position in that regard um, any decisions about where a person lives is a health and welfare decision rather than a property and affairs decision, albeit that there will be property and affairs considerations to be had along the way. Now, as I've said through the presentation, if decisions are being made about somebody who lacks capacity and it's a decision about where they should live, there really should be consultation with the family in any event. So you should get to have your say, put your concerns across and put forward what you want for P as well as what you think P would want as well.
because the family member will often be the person with the best understanding of P. It's possible to get health and welfare deputyship, as I've said during the presentation, um, but it is less common. And it does tend to be when there's going to be a series of decisions which need to be made. And again, the court thinks, well, from the outset, it's going to be much more practical if those decisions can be made by somebody on the ground in peace best interests, rather than an application having to be made every time to court, because not only is that time consuming and it's unpleasant for everybody involved to have to go to court every time, but it's also extremely expensive. Um, and therefore the court in those situations is becoming more commonly now um, more used to saying, OK, maybe a health and welfare deputy ship in these scenarios. Um, generally, property and affairs deputy ship, um, the application is a bit more straightforward. Um, it is something that if anybody wants further advice on in terms of the costs of, of legal help to do that, we can certainly give by way of guidance um, for legal advice to help with health and welfare deputy ship to do the full application, which includes supporting witness statements from family members as to why that the application has been made and why deputy ship is needed is roughly two to three thousand pounds plus that. Um, and that doesn't include, obviously, if the deputy ship is contested, in which case a formal hearing at court will be needed and that would increase costs significantly. But like I say, if, if further information is needed on that, by all means, get in touch with contact following the webinar um, and we, we can send through some further information. Now we've had another question through, so I'm just going to take a second to read that through and then I'll come back online. OK, so the next question that's come through is from Sandra. Thank you for your question. I think Sandra's question relates to the local authority refusing to provide him with a care package which would allow her son to live in a particular property for which she does hold a tenancy for. Um, I think in those circumstances, the framework that you would be looking at would be the Care Act rather than the Mental Capacity Act. And so I would refer you back to the slide about the Care Act which is at slide number 28. Um, essentially, the local authority has a duty to promote well-being and to assess needs and to meet needs. Now, if your son has, obviously I, I can't give specific advice um, and I don't know the, the full background and description of your son's difficulties, but if there are difficulties that you think should be met by way of a care package or a care and support plan, then certainly the first question I would be asking is the local authority to come out and do an actual assessment under the CARE Act. Um, and certainly if there was a refusal by the local authority to even do an assessment when you've said that your son has needs, then that would probably be worthy of a challenge um, because under the CARE Act, they do need to assess need where there is an eligible need. So my advice would be to contact the local authority, ask for a care assessment to be carried out as soon as possible. Um, again, it's quite a big area, the CARE Act, um, but certainly if it would help, we've got quite a few fact sheets about the various rights that you have under the CARE Act, and I'd be more than happy to pass those on um, to contact after the webinar as well. Another question's come through from Sarah in relation to deprivation of liberty, and the question is in relation to support of living. And Sarah asks, Does there, is it right that there's no action that needs to be taken even if in support of living there is a deprivation of liberty, unless P objects. No, that's essentially not the case. If there is a deprivation of liberty and somebody is living in support of living, then that needs to be actioned. It needs to be authorised. The difference in independent, in, in independent support of living is that the deprivation of liberty can't be authorised on paper by the local authority. It can't be done by way of a standard authorisation. It needs to be done by reference to the Court of Protection. So generally, in those cases, what will happen is either a family member or an RPR will say to the local authority, these care arrangements, I think, constitute the deprivation of peace liberty because they're under continuous supervision and control. They're not free to leave. And therefore, that's an interference with their Article 5 right. We'd like you to make an application to the court and have that deprivation of liberty authorised because otherwise that's an unlawful interference with P's Article 5 right. At that stage, the local authority should initiate proceedings in the Court of Protection 
Now, it might be that everybody agrees that where peas live in is the absolute best placement for them and that all of the arrangements on the ground are absolutely right for him to keep him safe, to make sure that he's engaged um, and really add to his health and well-being. In that case, the application will be very straightforward and it will literally be a streamlined process whereby the local authority will essentially initiate proceedings but ask the court to make at the very earliest stage an order which authorises the deprivation of liberty. So quite often in those cases, there isn't actually a need for any of the parties to attend court. It can all be done on paper through the Court of Protection. So if there's a bit of confusion that's arisen there, um, it's because there are essentially two systems involved. You've got the system where somebody's in a CQC care home or a hospital, in which case you're looking at the deprivation of liberty safeguards, a standard authorization being put in place. The alternative system was where somebody is living in the community potentially an ISL or a different setting and the dolls um, system is not available to them. So for somebody living in the community who's deprived of their liberty, then it needs to be authorised by the court of protection instead. Um, the issues around objection are more to do with when somebody is objecting in a placement um, and that puts on the RPR a duty to refer it to the court. So, for example, with a, somebody in a care home, for example, that authorisation will have been done on the papers, it will be done under the safeguards, and a standard authorisation will be in place which says this, this deprivation of liberty is authorised as being in the person's best interests. P might still not agree with that. P might still say, I don't want to be here, I don't want to live here, I don't need this amount of care, I want to go out on my own, I don't want somebody checking on me twice hourly at night, I don't need that. If P's making those kinds of objections, then P has an automatic right to refer the deprivation of liberty to the court of protection. And the court of protection will review all of the evidence and then will make declarations as to whether things need to change. So whether the care package needs to be made less restrictive, perhaps, or whether actually the current care package is in P's best interests and ought to continue. I think we've got probably time for one more question. Um, so I'm just going to take a moment to read and then I'll come back online. So we've got one question about um, who is the official solicitor. So I referred in one of my slides to the fact that to enable the participation of P within the proceedings, that P might need a litigation friend, and that can often be a family member, or if that's not appropriate, can be an IMCA. If there's no IMCA available, then it is possible for the official solicitor to act on P's behalf. The official solicitor is essentially a last resort litigation friend for adults who lack capacity. Um, so if there's another family member willing and able to act, then the official solicitor will not act. They have to be the last resort. They're essentially part of the judicial system um, to provide litigation friend services where there's nobody else available to fulfill that role. Um, and like I say, means that P is, is involved in the proceedings. And I think that's all the questions that have come through. So I just want to say thank you all for attending and I really hope that you found the webinar helpful. Um, if there are any follow-up questions which arise, please do feel free to send them through to contact and I'll try my best to, to get some replies by email. But thank you very much for attending.